Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I have very, very good news for you, and I have even better news for you. The good news is I am not Leo Strine. Uh, the better news is Leo will be speaking very uh, shortly. Um, I have this evening the easiest job in the world because introducing Leo Strine to a room of people interested in corporate governance is a little bit like introducing Captain Kirk at a Star Trek convention, <laughs> or Mick Jagger at a Rolling Stones concert, or dare I even say Warren Buffett at a Berkshire Hathaway meeting. Um, th th this, this, you know, literally everybody says, man needs no introduction. Um, but, uh, you know, Leo is chancellor of the Delaware Court of Chancery. Some people think that even when he was vice chancellor, he was chancellor of the Delaware Court of Chancery. Uh, but uh, Leo really is one of the most eloquent, thoughtful, measured, considered, profound voices in the area of corporate governance in the United States. And it's not merely because of the position that Leo holds, it's what Leo does with that position. Uh, I think it's fair to say that there's a level of significance that attaches to being Chancellor of the Delaware Court of Chancery, and Leo approaches that responsibility with a degree of intellectual heft and integrity that I think can stand as a model to virtually any court in the United States. Uh, and with that very brief introduction, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Captain Kirk. Well, it's a real honor to, to be here and to be introduced by one of the leading uh, corporate law scholars in the country and uh, just a wonderful person. I, I think those of you in the student body should be thrilled to have someone like Joe as your professor. I mean, he's someone that the business community respects, scholars respect, and I think also has an old school devotion to the academic institution and, and his students. And um, it's always just a pleasure to be around him. It's also a special honor for me to um, give the Mor Morrison and Forster lecture in honor of Marshall Small, such a distinguished person in the tradition of American corporate law. I, I'm honored to um, do a little work in the shadow of, of Marshall Small. Marshall was um, the, really the leading force behind the first director's guidebook um, that was done by the corporate law committee of the ABA. And I'm the special judicial consultant. I've worked on the several of the recent editions. They're, they're not as good as Marshall's. And uh, and he, he's just a real giant in the field, and so it's it's special for me to to be with you all at this this great institution. Now, I'm I'm going to try to honor the spirit of the lecture series today um, by focusing with you on a subject that my experience as a judge might qualify me to discuss. In a setting like this, someone like me can be most valuable by not pretending that I'm skilled at regressions or the like. I'm not, not gonna do anything, any kind of um, empirical analysis, either deeply meaningful or more commonly, what you receive is um, incredibly trivial. Um, I'm not doing either of those things. And instead, what I'm gonna do in the time we have together is talk to you about judging itself. And I mean judging as a judge, not, um, not sort of saying, you know, gee, I'm better looking than that person. I don't say that much, actually, um, which is a good thing, because the world would be pretty aesthetically disgraceful if, that, if I could actually honestly say that. Um, I can say that I'm smaller than most people who fly on airplanes. Um, I do that a lot, and uh, I think those of you who fly on airplanes Whatever you think about Mayor of Bloomberg, think about the next time you're on a flight, and whether you, you might not just have a point. But to the topic at hand, which is judging itself and the importance of judicial discipline to a well-regulated Republican democracy. 
Now, although this topic has implications for all of us as citizens, in my view, it has special importance for business because the predictability and therefore efficiency that results when the law is interpreted in a good faith, neutral way is critical to the ability of businesses to create wealth. In that vein, I come today to speak in favor of a judicial mindset that favors regular order over the episodic judicial grant of exemptions from required procedural expectations and the need to secure contractual rights at the bargaining table. I come today to advocate that judges use the imperfect tools we have to try to provide justice equitably, such as standards of review and principles of interpretation, consistently in like cases, and to call on judges to avoid deviating from those principles and standards when political pressures or other factors create a temptation for one-off situational departures. I come also to speak in favor of judges retaining our unique and difficult role as part of the government that does something uniquely different from the executive and legislative branches. By adhering to regular order, the judiciary does the most equity because it upholds the reasonable expectations of citizens in a society governed under law. A society that now accords a high level of procedural due process and that now enables all its citizens a fair opportunity to participate in electing legislators and the leaders of our executive branches. Now, I'm on a court of equity. That's what the Delaware Court of Chancery is. Our jurisdiction was actually, is actually that of the English Court of Chancery as of 1776 and such other jurisdiction as were given. And equity emerged in our legal tradition as a gap filler to do justice in a world of unevolved institutions and where not all people were treated the same way in similar circumstances. Equity continues to have a vital role as a gap filler and as a key default protection in relationships where one party is given broad discretionary authority over the property and rights of others. That's the essence of fiduciary duty review. But the equitable impulse is not, I will argue, a license for judges to apply personal idiosyncratic views of the right in cases and thereby enable litigants who have failed to follow procedural rules or to obtain the contract they wanted at the bargaining table to get a result from a court that is at odds with what regular order would have produced. Nor is the power of courts to review decisions of the legislative and executive branches for conformity with the Constitution, a license for judges to strike down rational decisions that the judges personally believe are socially harmful, or for judges to originate themselves constitutional rights without a firm basis in the text or history of the Constitution of our Republic. Judicial action of that kind erodes the ability of parties to fairly rely upon the procedural rules that supposedly exist to strike the right balance between fairness and efficiency in resolving cases. Judicial action of that kind erodes the ability of parties in commerce to freely enter into binding and fair commercial arrangements. Most of all, judicial action of that kind erodes the vigor of our republic by undercutting the effectiveness and accountability of the elected branches of government by subjecting their rulings to judicial whimsy. Even worse, it reduces the ability of citizens to rely with confidence on the fact that we are a nation under law, laws that apply consistently and not arbitrarily. Not only that, judicial action of that kind taints the judiciary itself by reducing the judiciary to just another partisan actor and the courts of justice to just another forum for, the, for a battle of ideological and partisan objectives rather than a different kind of branch of government, uniquely committed to being above the fray and trying to render expert adjudications based on neutral and generally applicable principles of fair interpretation rather than personal predilections. In this lecture, I'm gonna explore a few areas that exemplify these concerns. I will do so tersely in this case, knowing that this sophisticated audience is familiar with, with the general context. Now I'm going to begin with, a, with two words that often evoke groans on the part of law students and lawyers. Civil procedure. Any civil procedure junkies? Anybody want to run screaming like I didn't come to a civil procedure lecture, I'm a deal guy. 
deal protections, right? No, no, I'm talking about civil procedure. So brace yourself. Because civil procedure is incredibly important to the equity enhancing role of our courts. Since the 1930s, which David Berger, when David Berger was 32, the United States has embraced a system of civil procedure that has elevated full access to plaintiffs and broad access to information over efficiency concerns such as cost and speed. Plaintiffs are subject to liberal pleading standards, not necessarily the greatest tribute ever paid to the, my intellectual tradition of liberalism, but plaintiffs are subject to liberal pleading standards. Plaintiffs receive fulsome, and I mean that in all senses, discovery, fulsome. Lawyers in the room who write briefs, look up the word fulsome before you describe the judge's opinions as fulsome, because there's an element of disgust about the meaning, but people get fulsome discovery in the US. There are very few procedural snare traps in the United States so long as a litigant promptly corrects a prior pleading or asks for more time. They just aren't. Our nation takes legal claims seriously. No nation can rival the depth and breadth of American state and federal decisional law, and it just keeps coming. Some commentators, however, cry that a war crimes tribunal should be set up when the United States Supreme Court puts some rigor in the pleading standard by requiring plaintiffs to plead facts that, if true, plausibly support a cause of action. That this sort of modest burden can generate spirited disputes domestically shows just how committed we are to providing access to our courts. And that, I suppose, is my basic point. The rules of civil procedure in the United States are difficult to characterize as unfair when viewed from any comparative international law perspective. The injustices of the American judicial system seem more obviously to be the excessive length and cost of litigation in the US, rather than that the system sets up difficult obstacles to the pre presentation of worthy claims at all. Indeed, the very opportunity that plaintiffs receive to raise claims lightly and seek evidence gives defendants a corresponding chance to raise defenses and explore all possible information and may therefore boomerang on less well-heeled litigants facing well wealthier adversaries. Now, there are, of course, many debatable issues regarding the balance struck by American civil procedural rules and whether there are alterations that should be made. Should a plaintiff have to meet a plausibility or a conceivability standard? And are those things really different? Should all cases routinely involve electronic discovery? Now I will say, the success of your community here is, people will say in small dollar cases you shouldn't have electronic discovery, but the Silicon Valley is such a powerhouse that in reality, in a small business case, the only real discovery of any value will be in electronic form because there'll be nothing in paper. But that's a debate, how far, how many custodians do you do fruit devices or just hard drives of desktops, all that kind of stuff. And then you get things like, just how many times does a federal securities plaintiff get to amend their complaint before it's finally dismissed? Now, the, the last question seems to have been answered thus far at, at a minimum three. One dismissal motion a year for three years, and that's what we in the U.S. call litigation reform. Now, for today, though, my intent is not to engage with these less central questions, but to argue that a, uh, a premise that is both less contentious but more fundamental has a logical consequence. That premise is this. No person of sound reason could claim that American rules of civil procedure are illegitimate in the sense they are not the result of a good faith decision making process of a representative democracy that has torn down its worst barriers to access. The American approach to civil procedure is one designed to do equity to take the sport and caprice out of pleading. Debates about their wisdom should therefore be had in the appropriate forums by addressing proposals for change to the societal organs charged with adopting and amending the, the rules of civil procedure. And that premise is crucial and has this important logical consequence. I honestly don't understand the continued indulgence by the judiciary of litigants who fail to follow legitimate rules of civil procedure. When a plaintiff files a complaint, 
and faces a dismissal motion, why should he not be obliged to amend promptly at that time rather than getting to ask for a new chance when he loses and when all the costs of handling the first motion to dismiss have been needlessly incurred? If a plaintiff in a, in a derivative case knows she must plead demand excusal, knows that a statutory books and record action can help in that process, why should she be allowed to waste the resources of the court, the defendants, and the other investors in the company by rushing to court with a poorly crafted complaint, lose a motion to dismiss, and then be allowed to go back and do what she should have got, done from the get-go? Or as appellate judges would say, ab initio. Because if you speak like Gomer Pyle, but in Latin, it sounds smart somehow. Why are plaintiffs allowed to sit quietly by in the teeth of a summary judgment motion, not seek additional discovery under Rule 56F, and ask the trial judge for a do-over, or even worse, raise issues for the first time on appeal? Why do appellate courts allow litigants in a case not involving fundamental rights such as liberty or parental rights to raise issue on appeal that were not fairly presented to the trial court? Why do gun-shy trial judges put their fear of reversal over enforcing the rules of procedure in their courts? Adults recognize that rights come with responsibilities. Litigants make strategic and tactical choices in good faith reliance upon the rules. Judges who excuse parties from following clear rules of civil procedure often justify themselves as seeking to do equity, to do case-specific justice. But when judges deviate from fair, neutrally applicable rules, do they really do equity? Everyone who ever coached or played a sport and lost a game knows what it feels like to want a do-over. If I had only done this, only done that, that made that pass, made that substitution, changed that formation, if I could only change it all, I would get a different result. Well, sports are less, far less forgiving than the rules of civil procedure. Does a plaintiff get to have the court accept all her well-pled facts as true in addressing a motion to dismiss? Yep. Does a plaintiff get to freely amend to address a motion to dismiss? Yep. Do parties have a broad right to discovery in order to prove or defend a claim? Yes, they do. Do parties have a chance to defend a summary judgment motion by showing that discovery could turn up evidence defeating the motion? Yes. Is there a right to seek re-argument of a trial judge's ruling? Yes, but be careful. Because you know what you'll do? Your two by four might have only been nailed in with two nails. If you file one of those with me, it'll be nailed in with six. No, I'm kidding. I, grant, I, I just granted your motion for re-argument. But do be careful. That's a little CLE for you. But. May a party seek to reopen a judgment for newly discovered evidence that could not have been discer discerned in a timely way with the exercise of reasonable diligence? Yeah, you could do that too. Given these and other procedural protections, I just don't grasp the equity of excusing litigants from compliance with the rules. The inequities that result from doing that are obvious, but seem to be lost on judges tempted by sob stories or afraid that the appellate court will be. The inequities include, but aren't limited to, one, forcing the parties who have played by the rules, shaped their strategy by the rules, and made tactical and strategic judgments by the rules to suffer a do-over, or even worse, an outright loss based on foul play. That is an argument or issue or evidence that was not fairly and timely presented. Two, reducing the predictability of all litigation thereby generating more disputes and costs as litigants believe they can game the trial court system. Three, reducing trial courts to moot courts and diverting scarce judicial resources to non-binding run-throughs where litigants can rehearse their claims knowing that they get a second chance later. Four, making very real the claims of America's international competitors that our legal system is out of control and indulges parties who wish to enmesh opponents in years and years of costly litigation practice as an economic weapon. Five, pricing, affluent, non, pricing less affluent litigants out of the system by creating a system that lacks certainty and timely procession to closure, 
thus advantaging litigants who are less price sensitive. And finally, making trial gu judges gun shy to enforce the rules because bending the rules rather than enforcing one is the safe way for the trial judge to go and not get reversed. In my view, equity demands that all litigants follow the new normal rules. Otherwise, courts will be unable to afford everyone the same equal treatment. Litigants seeking one fair shot will have their chances diminished because others have exhausted the system's capacity for patient consideration. The more adamant and affluent a litigant is, the more he will demand. That's not equity, it's the exact problem equity arose to address. Rather than equitable rules of neutral application governing all, certain litigants are allowed more justice than others, necessarily rendering their litigation adversaries recipients of less than ordinary justice and undermining the overall fairness and efficiency of our entire system of justice. Doing equity requires judicial discipline, self-restraint, the willingness to hold litigants accountable for complying with rules of general applicability. Situational justice is not equity. It is the palliative, the breakfast mush of the timid conscience for judges unwilling to do the hard work of equity by upholding fair rules of civil procedure of general applicability. By refusing to excuse the failure of the parties to play by the rules, courts promote equity by demonstrating that the judicial system pro provides equal treatment to all and is not just the playthings of litigants with the resources or the talent to sell a sob story to secure special treatment. Now I'm now gonna turn to a, what I see as an analogous viral strain. This is the related deviation that from regular judicial order that occurs when judges employ what I call the MSU doctrine in lieu of adhering to accepted traditional judicial norms of decision making. Rather than sticking to the standard of review or other interpretive principles applicable to the type of case before them, the judges loose themselves from these constraining binds and free themselves up to deliver what they no doubt view as case specific justice. They quote, make stuff up, end quote. Now depending on your mood or frame of mind, another word than stuff might be apt. But precisely because judges employing the MSU doctrine have shorn the constraints of applying neutral principles of decision making, they necessarily introduce the potential for inequity by treating some cases as special, as involving a reason to deviate and reach a result that cannot be explained in terms of generally applicable standards that would govern similar cases. Now admittedly, Standards of review and other interpreter principles are flawed, imperfect tools. That follows, why? They're human made. But these tools, however imperfect, reflect the good faith struggle of many jurists facing many different cases over many years to come up with sound methods for addressing certain types of cases or legal situations in a reasoned, balanced way. Indeed, these standards often have built-in safety valves to ensure their equitable application. When these neutral methods of decision making are forsaken or distorted in a so-called hard case, judicial whim rather than genuine equity dictates the outcome, rendering the law both less predictable and less fair. I'm confident that the MSU doctrine can be glimpsed in more than a few areas of law. I mentioned three now, one involving contract law, one involving corporate law, and lastly, most worryingly, in public law, where there is a recent judicial willingness to override the judgments of the political branches by calling their actions arbitrary and capricious or by originating new areas that are now off limits to legislative action by dint of judicial fiat, in spite of generations of regulation and settled conduct by the political branches often approved as lawful by prior judicial precedent. Many of these recent decisions read like one side of a congressional debate, where an appellate majority convinced of its own policy wisdom simply declares the contrary policy reasoning of a legislative or administrative body unlawful, with no firm rooting in constitutional or statutory text, legislative history, or judicial precedent. Now let me begin 
with the more profane categories that involve laws addressing the hurly-burly of a capitalist society. A context in the business world where judges' personal predilections to do situational justice presents a constant danger of inequity is when judges are asked to address claims that a commercial party's conduct, despite not being prohibited by the express terms of a detailed lengthy contract, is instead prohibited by its interstices. The fact that parties can enter into binding predictable arrangements called contracts is a vital enabling factor for wealth creation in our society and for lawyers. When sophisticated parties take months to spell out their obligations in a detailed, complex agreement, courts should be reluctant to improvise by indulging claims based on the notion that a party to a 75-page, single-spaced agreement did not breach in its express term, but somehow violated a duty implicit in that dense draft. Putting to the side the need for a new presumption against the existence of microscopic interstices in single-space drafts, a judicial willingness to lightly accept such claims has several negative consequences that are, in my view, inequitable. For starters, when judges imply duties that are not set forth in carefully constructed contracts, they reduce human freedom. When an arm's length agreement specifically addresses what parties cannot do in excruciating detail, the conduct it does not address is that which remains open for free action within the bounds of positive law. Judicial additions to contracts that restrict human freedom subject commercial actors to arbitrary incursions, not justified by any lack of capacity by the complaining party to have gotten a written contractual prohibition in the first place. Furthermore, such judicial free ranging in the name of situational justice raises the cost of contracting by requiring parties to say not only what they mean to address and prescribe, but also to say what they do not mean to address and prescribe. I'm going to say that one more time, just because it's a little difficult, but it's, I think it's important. When judges free range and imply things that aren't in contracts, they raise the cost of contracting because the only way you ad can address that is you have to say in the contract not only what you mean to address and prescribe, but you also have to say what you do not mean to address and prescribe because the judges are making stuff up. The reality of that comes with this judicial inventiveness is that beneficial arrangements may be eschewed because of a fear that the court will imply more than the parties put down on paper. By being disciplined in enforcing contracts as written between sophisticated parties, courts enforce real equity by requiring parties wishing to restrict another's freedom of action to do so in the right place, the bargaining table, and by permitting market participants to proceed with the confident confidence that courts will accord all the equal respect of being subject to only those duties specified or clearly implied by the actual language of the party's bargain. There's a lapsarian tendency in the judiciary, however, to expand the implied covenant and to use it as a license for judges to reach what they deem to be a case-specific just result, to enforce the contract as the trial judges or appellate panel's heartstrings believe it should have been written. Jurists subject to this tendency also tend to freely gut or minimize the effect of contract provisions, such as non-waiver clauses, clearly requiring any waiver to be in writing, or non-reliance clauses, saying the parties disclaim any reliance on any non-contractual representations and warranties. Amazingly, Core contractual terms are sloughed off by courts as, quote, mere boilerplate. Now, this is, in my view, and this is for young lawyers, a very important concept to get in your head. This is the strangest type of reasoning imaginable because the definition of boilerplate is a, is a contractual provision so fundamental and important that it tends to appear in substantially similar forms in all contracts governing that context. Of course, 
the key thing is, so it's simply boilerplate, right? It's so clear and fundamental that it appears all the time in that situation thing. So because it's just boilerplate, you can just ignore that. Regular order in contract interpretation, that is a consistent adherence to settled interpretive principles focusing closely on the meaning of the contractual words, allows all players a fair opportunity to make mutually beneficial bargains on predictable terms. When judges twist interpretive doctrine to shape case-specific results, they do not do equity in its true sense. They give certain parties more than is due to them and undermine the reliability of voluntary contracts for all. That's also true in the pure corporate law context to which I turn now. Even when judges are called on to exercise equity jurisdiction in its core form, such as determining whether a corporate fiduciary has breached her fiduciary duties, judicial discipline in the form of a desire to deliver a result in a particular case, judicial indiscipline, can lead judges not to apply the same standard of due process to all cases. In other words, to make stuff up. The equitable overlay to American corporate law is part of its genius. The key to allowing directors to manage corporations under broad enabling statutes rather than highly prescriptive codes. But precisely because so much of corporate law involves judicial articulations of fiduciary duty principles, judges caught up in the moment sometimes mistake their role, forgetting that any condemnation of a legally permissible act on the grounds of inequity requires a finding that a fiduciary breached his equitable duties in a specific manner. Judges moved by the moment or feeling political pressures untether themselves from that disciplinary prerequisite and occasionally spew forth oxymoronic statutes of judge-made equity law. Per se rules of equity that proscribe in all circumstances conduct that is specifically permitted by statute, regardless of whether the directors have breached their fiduciary duties, narrow the freedom of action granted by the legislature and undercut the reliability of corporate law. With the decline of defined benefit pension plans and the resulting dependence of ordinary Americans on the success of the public equity markets, corporate debacles have become more politically salient than ever. Business unavoidably involves risk and the need to proceed in the face of uncertainty and even excellent managers can make decisions that go way wrong. Think, for those of you who are like my age, think about the new Coke. For younger people, no, that's not crack. <laughs> it was actually a version of Coca-Cola. Now, the business judgment rule, how does that play into this? Well, it exists in large measure to keep people like, for me, from second-guessing disinterested business decisions and thereby stifling the willingness of corporate fiduciaries to innovate, to be creative, to be bold, the essence of what often fuels important new sources of economic growth. When judges forget that and bend concepts such as gross negligence, financial interest, or good faith because of the potential unpopularity of adhering to the business judgment rule in a specific case, they undermine the wealth creating basis for the rule. Likewise, when judges forget that the equitable overlay exists to protect stockholders from overreaching by fiduciaries and does not exist to protect fiduciaries, this is a laughable way that things get turned, People have now been using equity to protect fiduciaries from the exercise of electoral and other rights by stockholders. That turns corporate law on its head. Instead of using equity as a cautiously employed and focused shield to protect stockholders from directors misusing their broad statutory powers for improper purposes, equity becomes a weapon against the stockholders, wielded by a judiciary that is unconstrained by the electorate and revealed by its own actions to be unconstrained by the discipline of adhering to the traditional structure of corporate law. Real equity demands that legally authorized actions by directors not be condemned as inequitable unless the directors have been found to have breached their fiduciary duties of care or loyalty on the basis of equitable principles that the court would apply in all similar cases. Real equity requires that stockholders be able to exercise their electoral and other rights unless those rights conflict with statutory, legislatively made, or contractual party-made restriction on that freedom, and not an equitable judge-made restriction. 
I come now to the last category, which you'll be glad to hear, because I said the word last. And this involves the non-corporate field and the dangers to societal equity when unelected judges view themselves as having a broad license to second-guess policy decisions made by the legislative and executive branches of government. There's little doubt, of course, that in some important moments, our judiciary has played a vital role in promoting a more equitable society by, for example, declaring de jure racial discrimination in public schools an equal protection violation in 1954. Even considering the reality that de jure racial discrimination should have been difficult, if not impossible, for anyone in good faith to linguistically reconcile with the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, a point that is not novel, it was made by Justice Harlan in his dissent in Plessy, one can admit that the judiciary's all too belated enforcement of the plain words of the 14th Amendment helped make our republic more legitimate by the first time giving all citizens a fair chance to elect their representatives and all citizens equal protection of the law. Of course, had the judiciary possessed the courage and good faith to enforce the clauses written in the first place, rather than hiding behind a morally and linguistically perverse doctrine that was waiting for George Orwell's birth to be labeled properly, separate but equal, a doctrine that they damn well knew to be a cloak for racial subordination because they damn well knew what was provided for black people was never equal, then our black citizens may not have had to endure another century of oppression. So if the judges had perhaps adhered to regular order in the first instance, they wouldn't have gotten a chance to be heroes 100 years later. But my task today is not to revisit or re-argue that shameful part of our past, but to discuss where we are right now. And where exactly is that? Happily, it's in a nation that has taken major and long overdue strides to rectify its past practice of race and sex discrimination, and where remaining areas of discrimination, for, exa for example, against people who are gay, are being rapidly addressed by the political branches themselves. What is strange and disturbing to me, however, is that with a more legitimate Congress, with more legitimate state legislatures, and with more legitimate executives, the traditional judicial reluctance to upset the decisions of the political branches, rather than being reinforced and strengthened by the sounder basis for deference that now exists because of the enfranchising of citizens regardless of sex, race, or ethnicity, seems instead to have been relaxed and in some cases abandoned. Respect for generations of prior judicial decisions, respect for the political branches, and respect for the public's ability to order their affairs in reliance upon settled interpretations of constitutional and statutory text are lightly put aside by judges confident that their novel view of things should supplant the decisions of those directly accountable to the electorate. I confess to being worried that the more constant use of the MSU doctrine in the public law context is beginning to generate justified skepticism on the part of the public that judges are just another form of partisan political actor, but garbed in robes that cloak and obscure their true agenda. Why do I say that? In public cases involving the business law area alone, the last five years have seen a number of eyebrow raising the decisions that seem to involve judges willing to advance their policy preferences over the determination of duly authorized legislative or administrative agency. The ease with, with, these, with which these judges can invent, or as I put it, originate, but originate in the sense of a novelist, if you will, new constitutional rights undiscovered for 200 or more years confidently determine that the decisions of a specifically empowered administrative agency are arbitrary and capricious despite evidence of years of study of a voluminous record, or tell an enforcement agency how to use its authority is disconcerting to me. In some of these cases, the policy end of the judge is one that I share as a citizen. But that does not mean, mind, I mean that I find favor with the decisions. To the contrary, who makes a decision in a republic matters immensely if we are to truly remain a republic. 
Judges who don't show respect to the legitimate authority of the legislative and executive branches threaten equity in a fundamental way by undermining the rule of law itself. Policy battles should be won at the battle bo ballot box in the electoral and legislative process. The policy whim of a momentary judicial majority is not justice. It is caprice and the opposite of equity. If a judge is not inclined to defer to the policy determinations of the political branches in the absence of any failure of equal participation by all affected citizens and to resolve all doubt in favor of upholding their judgments, he makes himself into an unelected and unaccountable lawmaker, willing to dictate to his society on the basis of his own preferences. Such a mindset enervates the strength of our republic, making citizens skeptical about the fairness of the system as a whole leading them to view political participation as a waste of time because judges will do what they want and to see the judiciary itself as just another bunch of self-interested partisans. The judicial role is a unique one. That role necessarily involves upholding the ability of litigants, including the government itself, to take action that the judge himself may not view as ideal or even moral when that action is not permitted by positive law when that law is interpreted using principles applicable to all like contexts. The judge's role is not to approve or disapprove the action of folks before him. The judge's role is to determine whether that is consistent with law. And the judge's role is to neutrally enforce the rules of, game, of the game of what is now an essentially open and inclusive participatory democracy. When judges adhere to their role, they do justice by each and every one, which is the essence of equity. When judges adhere to their role, they emph emphasize the central ideal of our republic, which is that those that directly, directly elected by the citizens are the primary lawmakers and are accountable for their wisdom to the electorate. The judicial pursuit of personal policy goals contradictory to those set legitimately by the right political branch players is a mu misuse of authority a subtle form of tyranny of its own, corrosive to the fundamentally equitable vision that animates our Republican form of democracy. On a more profane level directly relevant to business, when particular judges act as if they were licensed to create the law from anew, rather than interpret it based on neutral principles that give weight to our history and prior generations of law, they diminish the reliability of the law for those seeking to pursue business opportunities. Unless the law is bigger than any of us who are judges, even disciplined judges will be tempted to respond to a fellow judge's activism with activism of our own. What will be left is a less predictable and legitimate system of legal constraints for businesses to base their planning and operations on. The role of judiciary in enforcing regular order in society is obviously vital, as regular order in that context means enforcing the laws that regulate our conduct toward each other. But the judiciary cannot credibly enforce regular order if it does not adhere to regular order itself. Regular judicial order may not always be popular, and it sure isn't sexy, but it's vital to do, doing real equity in a Republican democracy, and it's also critical to wealth creation. Thank you for patiently listening to me. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Sure. Be happy to take questions.
I, I'm, you know, I'm not, I, I think I, I was proud to have clerked for two distinguished federal judges, both of whom were appointed by Republican presidents, and I'm a Democrat. I don't recall either of them considering for a moment partisan politics and decision making. I don't think that that is honestly something you can say about the federal judiciary today, and I think both parties bear a lot of responsibility for it. I think you don't lightly change the Constitution, but I think there's a a deeply broken system for appointing federal judges. Part of it is, frankly, lack of the, the when one party gets the presidency, the other party doesn't want to confirm everybody, anybody. So when it's your chance to do so, you want to not pick the solid center of the legal profession. You want to score ideological points when you can. One of the things we have in my state that actually I think I, I wouldn't commend everything in Delaware. Um, like, for example, there's times of the year where people eat muskrat. And I, I give you dispensation. All of you consider yourself to have eaten muskrat because I've done it for you. It's just, it's, it's just, it, it's, there's no amount of onion or wine. There's nothing. It's still going to taste pretty much like fishy mud. But we, we have in Delaware is a bipartisan judiciary. What do I mean by that, by bipartisan? We cannot have across our constitutional courts more than a plus one majority of any party. So every other judge is appointed is from a different political party. It's amazing what that does in terms of the incentives of who governors appoint. We also have a bipartisan thing. You pick the solid centers, the most distinguished lawyers from each party. When the votes are taken on the court, they don't break down along party lines, you know, and the decisions may be wrong, but it's not in any way infected by some sort of partisan battle. And I think there is studies by some folks who bridge academia and things showing that federal judiciary or decision making has become more partisan. It's more predictive along lines. And I think until they change the broken appointment system, you know, I'm not sure we're going to get any place. And it's both parties. Look, I mean, I, didn't, I, I purposely didn't cite cases in this because I wanted you all to actually think of cases for yourself. But, I, I, you know, I was involved in, in the whole fight about Dodd-Frank, and I know for darn sure that the say on pay was non-binding. The vote was non-binding. Well, there was a federal district judge who let somebody state a claim in federal jurisdiction because a board didn't go along with a non-binding Santa pay vote that was supposed to not create any cause of action. It says it right there in the statute. It should have been dismissed. It was one paragraph. It's like, read the statute. You don't, I wouldn't even probably have written a decision. I'd probably give a bench ruling saying, you know, let Bloomberg get the news out that the statute means exactly what it says. But even like, look, honestly, my former boss fought really hard to, there was a part of Senator Schumer's um, bill, a part of the Dodd-Frank bill about proxy access, and it originally said that the SEC may, I mean, SEC shall do something, shall do proxy access. Then it said specifically the SEC may. Well, th apparently the D.C. Circuit says the SEC may not. So I don't know how Congress, and I was against, I thought federal proxy access was idiocy because they had been the reason they had gagged people from using bylaws. But the arbitrary and capricious standard, for those of your business folks who aren't admin lawyers, that's the admin law equivalent of the business judgment rule. Right? You're allowed to do something stupid as long as you study it. Unless you need a guardian for your person, you can't breach that. I don't really know how they got there. I mean, I actually helped write a little amicus brief. I kind of ghost wrote something and everything. I didn't really believe it. Um, but I couldn't, I, I thought there's no way we'd win. I mean, I don't know how anybody could say when Congress just passed a statute saying the SEC may do something. That seemed to me to say that they were allowed to do it. 
And having been there, I know, I mean, they may not have read the thousands of pages the way that the majority of the appellate court wanted them to read it. They clearly read it. And so I think on both sides, you're starting to see, you know, and, and I think the problem is you can't just pick out the case where you like the result. Because for those of you who may not have dug proxy access, you might like an environmental rule because you have a, a beach home and you might like the clean water. And the next thing to go down will be the EPA's regulation on that. I mean, stuff, I mean, again, SEC, I know one thing about them, they don't make anything, but they're bipartisan when they have a unanimous enforcement decision. They're not a plaintiff's lawyer. When they present a settlement, I'm not sure how they're on equal footing with somebody who has 100, who represents somebody with 100 shares. That's the United States of America. And I, I just I have a different, and I see there's, and that's just, those are just in the business sphere. Yeah. I tell you, I'm, I'm working now, I didn't talk much about the whole political thing, but I'm, I, I want somebody to find a, a uh, you know, one of those corporations chartered the time of the First Amendment to make unlimited political expenditures expressly advocating the election or defeat of a political candidate. I, I don't make a lot of money, but I'm willing to give one paycheck to somebody who finds me one of those specifically chartered entities. Because they didn't exist. Because the only corporations who existed at the time when the First Amendment was founded were specifically chartered by legislators for specific purposes. And you could only do that was, which is in your specific charter and the ultra virus doctrine was in full force. But now ExxonMobil is the same as you and me. Right? And people like radicals like Republican Supreme Court justices within the last 25 years find their work just erased. Not some liberal state, Montana's. Montana has been breaching our constitution for, since when, Joe? Is it 1909? What was the statute? They, I mean, somebody must know. They had a statute that for over 100 years they have been violating the First Amendment. People out west, near you, gun-toting, freedom-hating people and finally, we discovered, we discovered like 2010 that the Montana, Montanians were just not allowing freedom to rule. I think it's this other thing where people, that's where the MSU stuff comes in. I mean, people making stuff up. And do I have an answer for it? I do think you're going to have to do something about this political process. I actually think if the Senate, in a weird way, if they would get rid of something that's old that's destroying them like the the filibuster, that would help in this area. But if they went back to something older school, it would also help in this area. Which is if they would give more deference to the congressional delegation from the states over judicial selection, and they would defer to each other, they'd get a lot more judges. It's been amazing situations where judges have been supported by the opposite state, opposite political party senators from their state and can't get confirmed. And I think some of that close to the people stuff actually works in a way of getting a more solid centered judiciary than maybe we're getting now when we sort of nationalized everything. But, uh, you know, if there were easy, there are easier answers, fix the filibuster rule, fix that. But, you know, we don't even believe in this country that before you buy, you know, if you coach Little League, you have to have to get a background check, but apparently you can buy a weapon, you know, you don't have to get one. So. We're in a world whose logic I don't quite get. I think we've stupefied. Sabrina, what are you doing on the West Coast? Mm -hmm. I have to say, I'm not, I was never the chancellor when Bill Chandler was chancellor. In fact, the former chancellor is now a proud partner of Wilson Sonsini, a Silicon Valley law firm. Sabrina, your question. I'm not a big, you know, it's interesting because one of the more painful things recently is I was accused of um, 
issuing dictum and an opinion, <laughs> and I did not understand it to be dictum. I actually try, I'm not a big fan of shaming, like I hate, that you, there's a bunch of corporate law people talk about shaming. I, I don't do shaming, I'm not into that. Maybe I was raised Catholic, there's enough guilt to go around, I don't want to add to it. So I'm, I'm actually, I don't think, I, I tend to be fairly sparing about it, and, I, and again, it's part of my view is, you got to be careful in when you're not deciding an actual matter. For example, the thing I got hit on was that I supposedly said unnecessarily that there was, when you have a limited liability company in Delaware, there's a default that you owe fiduciary duties. And I was chastised but affirmed, and that's a fair word. I mean, I respect my Supreme Court, and I respect my Chief Justice as a good friend of mine, and I, a person I really respect, but I got chastised for writing about this issue on the grounds that it wasn't relevant. And what hurt me about that was the parties had put it in contention before me the, there was an individual who had not signed the LLC agreement. He was not named as a fiduciary. He was the controlling person of an entity, which was the managing member of the LLC. Part of why I wrote about whether there was a default duty is it made sense that he would could be liable if, under default principles, as a controlling person, he would have had control over the property of others. Then you look to our LLC statute that says you can modify or eliminate fiduciary duties. And I thought it was important to explain why this gentleman who was being sued could actually be liable because he actually denied in his answer in a part of the appellate decision that was not cited, he denied that he was a fiduciary. I was affirmed on the grounds that he owed contractual fiduciary duties. The thing I still am wondering is how he owed contractual fiduciary duties when he wasn't a signatory to the contract. And what I'm saying is, I didn't even think, my, I did not think my reasoning was at all dictum. I thought, you know, as sort of a due process thing, to hold someone liable, you had to have a reason for it. And I think judges have to be careful about, as I said, you have to be careful about side lectures, best practices. I mean, it's useful, you can do a nudge. But those of you rely on, you know, you rely on transactional authority. I thought the first Time Warner decision was unfair to a lot of members in the, in the transactional bar when QVC came out. Remember they affirmed Chancellor Allen on his ring, but on different grounds? Well, a lot of people then said, well, we're basically, if you're affirming on different grounds, then the original grounds can't be good. And then they back in QVC, they said, well, no, Chancellor Allen said it in Time Warner. You know, people get paid money, their clients kind of get angry when they make mistakes. So I think we got to be careful because we do have a precious role. And I'll tell you one of the things that some of your business lawyers, be careful with this now, this bench ruling is Samisat literature. The bench rulings are flying around too much. You're making too much out of them. In 1987, you wouldn't have ever read it. it, it you know, when I issue a bench ruling, it's because there are basically two reasons. I don't have time to write. And if I don't have time to write, then you should be careful relying upon it because if I had to maybe give the ruling in 24 hours, I had 24 hours to do it. Or I should be applying settled law, not making new law. So it should be rare, but I think we're in this world of immediacy, and that's one of the things that's affecting the judiciary too. Everybody's reading too much. Professors are too worried about getting an op-ed into the Wall Street Journal, you know, pushing out their scholarship and SSRN to get it out there so they can pump an op-ed, then they're writing a book. People don't even read books anymore because you can't get them on SSRN or NLI. So the fact that somebody wrote a 500-page book, I mean, It'd be fun, and, we, and I think for those of you in practice, you've got to watch that. And, and I'm worried, I'm in a profession where everything I say is taken down by a court reporter. And I've certainly learned some lessons about that. Now, I mean, I would never joke about preppy clothing again. It's a very serious thing, preppy clothing. Um, but, you know, you as lawyers have to be careful that just because a judge says something in a bench ruling doesn't mean it has equal dignity with precedent. And that's the kind of world that we're living in. And I think, Sabrina, we have to even be more cautious in that world about 
kind of getting out of our lane. Like somebody once says, hey, what do I look for in a top-up option? Is that like if I order a martini, they'll give me a, a pour? I mean, that's what I would be looking for in a top-up option. I'm not going to give any of you as transactional lawyers. I don't go sit around like a, thinking what, and I, it's not my role. What I should be looking at, what I should be ruling upon is there's a particular top-up option. Somebody is litigating it about a problem that it causes, and I will address the implications of that. Not reaching out, because each of our windows, right, everybody thinks they have I always worry when judges write from experience. Because it's going to be rare. Like, I think I'm pretty experienced by now. When I'm looking at one briefing team, and it's got 13 lawyers from two respected firms, one in Delaware, one out. The other team has 15 lawyers. And I'm going to rule from experience, and one side's going to lose, and the other's going to win? Does that mean that the other side had no experience? I think it's our, our, we can't, and I think sometimes judges lecture without giving the actual, we skip the part that matters. The part that matters is actually applying the standard of review in a principled way and giving a reasoned explanation of how the claim before the court is resolved. And I think sometimes people just go into, oh, I'm really cool. I think I know what I'm doing here. I'm gonna skip that stuff and I'll just kind of give the bottom line and I'll tell the world how they should do things from now on. And I actually think we gain more respect and I actually think we proliferate better practices if we just handle the cases in front of us, address the lessons that naturally come out of those, and then wait for the, the next cases to come along. As you can tell, I'm, not, I, I get, I'm actually more nervous than you might imagine, so I tend to turn everything into a, a long answer. But should we free the, should we free the people, Joe? Are you willing to release? I've been willing to. I, I release you all. I've already given them dispensation. You've all had muskrat. And uh, <laughs> thank you.